quite a good program today with plenty of expert opinion on the concepts around net zero and uh, and carbon neutrality and what the difference is and how we can uh, make sure we know what we're talking about. Uh, so I think we're going to have a good program today. Um, you'll notice in the chat that Wendy has popped in the date of the next event uh, already. So if you are interested in renewables on your site, uh, then this is part two of an event uh, following up an event from earlier in the year, which was very well received. So this one should be a good one as well. Uh, I'm geeking out this morning because I've just had solar panels installed at home and the sun's just come out. So I'm very excited to be now entirely self-sufficient. Um, and I suspect John and Wendy are the same. So this could be our lowest carbon event uh, ever with uh, at least three of our speakers uh, coming to you carbon neutral. Um, so I think we're just going to start with a quick poll. So on your screens, uh, we've got just a quick question for you. If your phone does QR codes, then just hold it up to the screen. And we'd just be interested to know whether any of you have already set a carbon neutral or a net zero target uh, or indeed both. Um, so if you can uh, have a quick scan of that and we'll get an idea of our audience today and what sort of targets you've already got. Um, there we go. Let's have a little look at what we've got here. We've got um, 31 of you have responded. So maybe, Duncan, if you can pop the uh, just the manual link there in the in the chat function. For those who don't know, it's on the top ribbon. Please find that and uh, we'll have a look at a few responses. Uh, you may see the numbers go up as we look at this. So let, let's do this on the fly here. Uh, we asked, do you have net zero or carbon neutral commitment in place? Uh, multiple answers allowed on this one. So let's have a look. Um, oh, it's changing as we speak. Oh, this is exciting. Right. We can see still at the moment in the red, though it's moving around a lot, we can see that we don't have one in place. But actually, we're moving really quickly here. We have a net zero commitment. That looks as though that, that little slice of the pie is going up. And um, this is actually very exciting. Uh, carbon neutral actually is of equal size there. So actually, when we look at the individual slices there of the net zero and um, carbon neutral, neutral that's exceeding 50 percent now so uh, that, that's really quite encouraging and and there we are in the green we've got um some of you that have both um duncan i think that's quite an impressive result yeah I and mean, that's really encouraging to see just how many people have already set those targets mm -hmm. um and hopefully are obviously making progress towards them as well um and i obviously need to up my game because i know we've only got a carbon neutral commitment at the moment <laughs> which uh well obviously we set when we weren't into even entirely sure what the what the terms meant, um, and we we uh, we achieved that against our baseline last year, um, but of a relatively modest baseline. So now we've got to do our scope threes and uh, reset our targets, and start working towards that net zero. But it's good to see so many people have already set those targets. And, it really uh, is gives us a lot of hope. <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully following today's session, some of you will go away with the knowledge and the impetus to to start making those commitments. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Pete, who's our first speaker today, who's going to talk about a little bit of legal stuff. So, uh, there's been some stuff going on in legislation recently. Uh, and then he's going to talk about science based targets and uh, the SME route particularly for smaller businesses, which is a slightly easier route into uh, science-based targets than perhaps the sort of larger corporate uh, event. So, Pete, over to you. Thanks, Duncan. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. So I've got a kind of a, a two-slot uh, session here to go through a bit of a legal update in terms of some of the um, changes that have been happening in the environmental sort of legal space. And then secondly, to go through the SME pathway to science-based targets. So just to start with the, the legal update, there is a bit of a theme to uh, today's legal update, which is um, effectively environmental targets that are being set as part of the uh, Environment Act. So this is actually starting to create some more focus in terms of commitments um, that uh, in England that need to be made uh, across various things around sort of biodiversity, marine protection, resource efficiency, et cetera. So I'll just kind of give you a bit of a, a flavour of what these um, targets are looking like which of course is a really positive thing to see, all of which is kind of supporting our approach to um, uh, you know, a very proactive and environmental management program in England, but also really you know, as part of our bigger picture and linking into today's theme for the, uh, the session around net zero carbon and sort of protecting uh, these areas. 
So one of the first environmental target areas that's been set is specifically around biodiversity. So there's a couple of key um, sort of target areas uh, within this biodiversity regulations. The first thing is around focusing on long term species extinction risk. So essentially putting in place targets to reduce the risk of species extinction um, compared to current levels. Another area of focus is around wildlife rich habitat restoration or creation. So here it's got a, a target of in excess of 500,000 hectares of a range of wildlife rich habitats to be restored by 2042. There's also targets around species abundance, um, so trying to make sure that the uh, decline in overall abundance of species is halted by 2030, which is obviously a very key issue at the moment. And also longer term targets to then reverse that decline in species abundance to actually sort of get things improving. Um, so kind of basing it on a 10% uh, a higher than overall species index at the moment. So there's kind of a variety of different areas of focus to really enhance and restore biodiversity. On a similar theme is environmental targets for woodland and trees outside woodlands. So again, establishing legally binding targets via the Environment Act um, so that by the end of 2050, at least 16.5% of all land in England must be covered by woodland and trees outside of woodland. I think just from watching the, the most recent David Asprey series um, that is focused obviously on the UK, I think at the moment, you know, the, the, the figures that kind of quoted in there was we're about 13% at the moment in terms of um, woodland coverage across the UK. So, you know, this is really trying to see an enhancement of uh, woodland coverage in the UK. Slightly different area of focus is around targets for marine protected areas, again, establishing legally binding targets via the Environment Act. So this is trying to set targets to improve the, um, the status of marine protected areas. So to move them into a favourable condition and that, that applies to 70% um, of marine protected areas and for the remaining 30% to be in a recovering condition. At the moment, a lot of our marine protected areas are in uh, sort of under threat or in, in decline. So actually, this is really trying to move that focus forward to actually having good um, marine protected areas that are in a good status, a favourable, favourable condition. One of the other sort of focus areas, again, around establishing legally binding targets is about residual waste. So this is really trying to promote and encourage resource efficiency and waste reduction. So by 2042, the total mass of residual waste for, for that year must not exceed 287 kilograms per head of population in England. It's quite a specific target, but again, really trying to promote and encourage a more circular approach to uh, resource efficiency. Um, rather than sort of our conventional linear take, make, dispose. Another separate area of focus, again, for environmental targets, legally binding via the Environment Act, is to focus on water. So there's a variety of different um, target areas of focus under this, this category. So there's an agricultural um, water target, which is really aimed at reducing nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment into water supplies. A wastewater uh, target as well, again focused on phosphorus, and an abandoned metal mines water target, so effectively reducing metals pollution. Essentially, these targets are all aimed at improving the water quality um, of our waterways in England, and again linking through to sort of biodiversity and river health, so trying to restore and protect um, these areas by preventing um, pollutants from, from entering them. So kind of targeting very specific areas um, that have a high contribution to sort of pollution in these settings. And the last area just to, to kind of focus on for today's session um, is around particulate matter. Um, obviously quite a sort of um, uh, a prevalent topic at the moment with things like sort of um, wood burning stoves and, and sort of um, uh, sort of the impacts around um, sort of areas of more vulnerable zones around sort of um, uh, schools around different types of particular matters and things. It's quite a sort of a, a hot topic. So really, this is about trying to set reduction levels for particular matter, um, you know, in the in the air and again, legally binding targets via the Environment Act. So it sets a uh, an average concentration target for reduction. Um, but also an exposure reduction target as well, which is obviously a really kind of key aspect, particularly in um, very urban built up areas. So trying to reduce that by 35% in terms of that exposure levels. 
So I hope from sort of a, a bit of a brief overview of the kind of legal um, update that you can sort of see that there is a variety of different focus areas for different targets that are coming in via the Environment Act, which is really positive because this will then start to structure policy that sits behind that in order to make sure that these targets are adhered to. So continuing with the, uh, the theme of targets, moving into the, the sort of next bit of the update, which is around the Science-Based Targets Initiative and specifically focusing on the, the SME pathway. So I'm sure most people have probably heard of the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Essentially, it is a, an initiative that's been set up to help organisations to set science-based targets. So it's effectively providing um, guidance uh, on how you would go about that process of setting targets. So there's more than 4,000 businesses that are working with the SBETI to try to reduce their emissions. And importantly, for the science-based part of it, it's in line with climate science. So there's essentially two aspects to this. There's kind of science-based targets, near-term targets, and there is also a net zero uh, standard as well. So there's kind of two, two aspects to that that I'll kind of break down through, through this session. Just for context, obviously based on the, the amount of time available, this will be quite a high level overview of the SBTI and the processes, um, and really focusing on the SME aspect. But if anyone has any questions on the process, do feel free to, to get in touch. My details will be on the last, our last slide. But essentially the, the principle around a science-based target is it's helping um, companies to determine how much and how fast they need to reduce their emissions to align with temperature goals. Now, essentially, most of those temperature goals that are being set now are to a one and a half degree scenario, one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, and really, this is trying to be in line with the Paris Agreement. So 1.5 degrees is the kind of highest level of ambition um, within that. Of course, the, the Paris Agreement was initially established to um, keep warming to well below two degrees. So this is kind of based on the science of that sort of um, that, that temperature change and linking to then how much does my organisation need to reduce in order to make sure that my um, my contribution to that is in line with those temperature goals to reduce emissions. So in principle, that looks something a little bit like this. You know, this is um, kind of warming projections through to 2100. And you can kind of start to see these decarbonisation profile trends at different sort of um, policy levels. And you can see there the sort of uh, lighter amber and green lines are the one and a half degree and two degree scenario. So science-based targets are essentially aligned with these two uh, these two scenarios to try to reduce emissions. So generally, your your kind of emissions reduction profile would look something similar um, to the sort of light amber and, and green line here. And the importance of that, of course, is because of the climate science part of it, the science based part of this, which is around minimising the climate change impacts associated with those different temperature profiles. And you can just see from the table on screen some of the different examples of actually the um, impact escalating as temperature increases from one and a half degree to two degrees. So that is really why the SPTI and other sort of science-based targets approaches are really trying to push towards the one and a half degree scenario, and certainly for the net zero standard to, to push to one and a half degree, to really try to minimise as much of these impacts because they do escalate at different sort of temperature profiles. So in terms of the, the process um, for setting a science-based target with the SPTI, there is conventionally five stages, um, the first of which is signing a commitment letter, essentially that you are committing as an organisation to developing a science-based target and that you are then going to submit that within a, a period of time, within two years, um, to make sure that you're taking action. The second stage is then actually developing that target, so actually starting to work with the criteria and the guidance for which there is a huge range of guidance. And I know that not just SMEs will be on this call today, so there are specific industry guidances as well, uh, as well as sort of for large corporates. So it's worth making sure that you're reviewing the right guidance to take the correct approach to setting your science based target. The submission process, obviously the SBTI then go through an official validation process where they are validating that your footprint is accurate, that your um, approach to um, your, your um, technical approach to setting the science-based target is correct and consistent with the right guidance for, for your sector. There's a communication piece um, you know, that is effectively communicated via the SBTI website, via your own website. Um, so to try and make sure that you are then cascading that you are taking proactive action. 
and a disclosure phase. So then reporting on your emissions progress against the targets on an annual basis. So typically through your websites or through your um, annual reports and disclosures to the various kinds of stakeholders. So it's quite a thorough and comprehensive process. It does take a period of time really to set a science-based target. So for SMEs who may not necessarily have the um, right level of resourcing and capacity to be able to do that, there is a, a streamlined process which enables them to set a target in a, in a slightly easier, uh, easier way. So in terms of who qualifies as an SME, the SB, SBTI has defined that as a non-subsidiary independent company with fewer than 500 employees. And essentially, if you are then qualifying as an SME, you can then go through a streamlined target validation route. So it essentially enables you to bypass that initial step of making a commitment to setting a science-based target and um, uh, sort of avoiding the regular um, target validation process. So you can essentially set near-term science-based targets for scope one and two immediately um, and you could also set um, net zero targets as well and the important part around this to enable SMEs to do this quickly and efficiently um, there are predefined target options to make it easier uh, to complete so you would then go through that process of selecting a, uh, a predefined target option, whether you're going to be setting near term and or net, uh, uh, net zero targets, select your base year, select your target year. Um, and in terms of the sort of emissions profile, it's got to cover almost all of your scope one, scope two emissions, 95 percent. And you have to report your scope three data if you're going to set a net zero target. In terms of a near term target, a near term target essentially covers a five to 10 year period. So these are really valuable targets because it's actually demonstrating what you're going to do in the near term to take proactive action to decarbonize your organization's activities. Net zero targets are longer term, so no later than 2050, um, but would also cover sort of a wider um, range of targets in terms of scope three emissions as well. So if you are setting net zero, you do need to align with that one and a half degree scenario. And uh, there's just a little bit of information there on the kind of costs associated with this from an SME perspective. These are different if you are a non-SME. So $1,000 if you're setting a new target or replacing a target. $1,000 if you're setting a net zero only target, if you've already got an existing near term. And then if you're setting both twice the fee, you know, in terms of $2,000. So in terms of that kind of um, what those two target types look like, just to kind of demonstrate on the screen, sort of the net zero target um, so the near term targets covering this five to 10 year period. So these are really valuable targets because these are really starting your approach to decarbonisation quite quickly. So they're quite meaningful, um, meaningful targets, whereas your longer term net zero targets, you know, really might be going through to 2050. So are more about your kind of strategic approach to achieving net zero, albeit you need to be demonstrating alignment with your, your near term targets as well. So that's just to kind of um, demonstrate the slight difference between the two the two standards. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just um, run through just some of the um, approaches really for near term. As I mentioned earlier, there are predefined target options. So the SME um, approach has some uh, specific guidance packs which are available, which I've got the links for on the last slide. Um, but essentially, this helps you to set a predefined target from sort of a variety of options that are available based on the base year that you'd be submitting as part of your target. So it's a um, uh, sort of quite quick approach to setting a net zero uh, at near term target. Similarly, for net zero, again, there's predefined target options. So you've got to achieve a minimum of a 90 percent reduction by 2050. Um, but it just helps you to kind of set these um, uh, targets in a sort of uh, quick and efficient manner. Of course, with setting a science based target, a huge amount of benefits in terms of that, in terms of um, reputation. Uh, it's probably going to be something that we're going to start to see cascade through supply chains from larger suppliers, um, uh, uh, you know, requesting that people in their supply chain are starting to set science based targets. So that kind of leads into a bit of investor confidence that actually you're running a, a resilient business um, that is future proofed against climate change and trying to decarbonize, um, you know, which can lead to competitive edge, bottom line savings and just ultimately sort of good resilience. So there's a huge array of benefits to setting SBTs. In terms of resources available for SMEs, 
Um, there is a target validation booking system, which is a, essentially a, um, a form that you go through to set your uh, set your targets. And there is also a specific FAQs for SMEs, both of which have got the links on this presentation, which is available um, after today. So if you want to kind of click through to those, that just kind of take you straight through to the SME resources. Conscious that was a very high level uh, uh, sort of take through sort of the environmental legal update and uh, science based targets approach for, for SMEs. My details are on screen and I'll pop them in the chat. So if you do have any specific questions um, related to your organisation, um, please do feel free to, uh, to just get in touch. But thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Um, so I should have said at the start, we've got a panel discussion at the end. Um, so we're going to try and save. Uh, if you could put all your questions in the chat and then we'll try and do them as a group at the end. Um, however, I do notice we've got a couple of specific ones that have come in that might be actually particularly relevant to Pete. Um, firstly, yes, slides will be available afterwards. They'll be on the uh, Carbon Footprint Sustainable Business Network page uh, along with the recording. So you can download them from there um, if you want to keep a copy. Um, and just a couple of specific questions, uh, one from Hugh. I'd like to know, would the streamline process for SMEs be acceptable for compliance with large group supply chain needs? Yeah, so if you're eligible as an SME, this is a credible and valid approach to setting a science based target. So um, in terms of if you are a part of that supply chain, as I was mentioning, it's quite likely that larger organisations are going to require organisations in their supply chain to set an SBT. This is a valid approach to doing that if you are yourself an SME. Great, thank you. And then just quickly from Tim, do you know if the guides for the sustainable business, uh, the sustainable targets have been set now for the oil and gas sector? Uh, I don't believe so. I think they are still at a, a, a draft stage um, as of sort of early January this year. But um, uh, there are, for, for anyone else that's in a specific sector on the science based targets website, there is a sector guidance tab which breaks down all of these sectors that have specific guidance forms. And it has all of the updates available on what is available and what is a current um, and also what is the focus areas for the SPTI in terms of additional um, sectors because they're trying to bring new ones on over time. Right. Thank you very much. As I say, any more questions, just keep popping them in the chat and we'll come to them as a group uh, in the last sort of 15 minutes or so. Uh, so, John, can you try and grab the screen and we'll hand over to you? Ruby, let's see if I can do that. Um... There we go. I can see that. Over to you. Excellent. Ah, superb. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. So I'm, I'm talking today about carbon offsetting. Um, I'm going to explain the difference between reduction and, and removal in terms of carbon offsetting. And then there is a new ISO guidance out on net zero, uh, which fits really nicely uh, with what Pete was talking about with the science based targets. So I'll, I'll touch on that at the end as well. Um, but to, to get started, let's just do a bit of calibration just to make sure every, everybody's got the same starting point on what carbon offsetting is. Um, it can be a bit of a controversial area. Um, yeah, some some people think it's a way of covering up and doing a bit of greenwashing. Others see it much more as a way of a key key element of of tackling climate change by um, funding projects around the world. So I thought I'd put this slide up just to start with just to sort of say a little bit about what carbon offsetting really is. It, it is a mechanism for funding and providing financial support for projects around the world to either reduce greenhouse gas emissions or remove them from the atmosphere. And I'll talk more about the specific types of projects that fall into those two categories, the reduction and the removal in a second, because that is quite key, especially when we're talking about science-based targets. Um, yeah, that Peter's just talked about. Um, carbon offsetting, it, this guy here, a lot of you might recognise him, it's Mark Carney, he used to be the Governor of the Bank of England, he's now the UN Special Envoy on Climate Ch Action and Finance, and he's a really big advocate on carbon offsetting because he realises that to, to solve climate change, we need to be funding a lot of projects around the world that uh, decarbonise the world effectively um, and remove carbon emissions, and we need to get more and more finance into it. So. You know, he, his statement here is we know we have a limited carbon budget on some measures. We only have 10 years left at current emission rates before we have blown the 1.5 degrees of, of warming and moved to more catastrophic levels. 
So we need to preserve and extend that budget as much as possible and carbon offsetting helps to do that. He does actually, at the end of this statement, I'll let you read through all this on, on your own, but he does say that in no way is carbon offsetting a silver bullet uh, that removes a responsibility from anybody to to reduce their absolute emissions as well. So it's got to be, it's a tool, it's a tool that's used alongside what you're already doing within your own organisations to reduce those carbon emissions and head to a sort of net zero uh, situation. So I mentioned there's uh, two types of carbon offsetting uh, that people are typically talking about nowadays. There's a reduction where we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's going into the atmosphere. And when I say carbon dioxide, I, I, I always mean actually greenhouse gases. So it's a reduction of the greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere and the removal is taking those out of the atmosphere. So, so in terms of reduction category, you've got things like decarbonizing energy grids, renewable energy, things like solar power, um, that uh, Duncan's already got on his house, um, things like wind power, um, and geothermal and things like that so lots of good renewable energy examples that some of you may have already used in your own carbon offsetting um, energy efficiency type projects um, so things that uh, improve the efficiency and reduce the amount of uh, electricity and other fossil fuels that need to be burnt so you know typical carbon offset projects so things like uh, cook stove projects efficient cook stove projects in developing parts of the world or clean drinking water projects where you don't need to boil the water uh, before you can drink it and then there's reducing deforestation this is a category that is a reduction in carbon emissions because we're stopping carbon emissions being re released from the, the forests that are already there so they're kind of the, they're broad categories of reduction and then in removal you've got the types of things technologies that will actually take uh, the carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere and other, potentially other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So the obvious one that most people will understand is forestry type projects, afforestation and reforestation, where as the trees grow, they obviously uh, sequester the carbon into the wood of the trees. Uh, but there's more and more projects that are starting to be de developed now. Direct air capture hits the news quite often. And you can see the picture on this slide of a big kind of factory that slowly sucks out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And there are other superb technologies like biochar and enhanced weathering that's getting quite a lot of attention at the moment of being ways of taking taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So there's those two categories. And why that's, uh, well, before I get on to why that's important <laughs> in the context, um, I thought I'd sort of say, there's a there's a big focus actually on trying to do shift to more of a carbon removal type of, of strategy. If you look at the science based targets, it heavily talks about carbon removal. And, and when you're setting your net zero target for 2050 or hopefully before that, um, to, if, if you still have residual carbon emissions at the end, uh, the science based target initiatives want you to remove those rather than funding projects that are a carbon reduction at the moment it's quite hard to switch to carbon removal. Firstly, because there isn't a huge amount of availability of these types of projects, um, and the price of the projects is also of pr pretty expensive. So, the, so in a way, what you've got to do is come up with a strategy to you know, start focusing on the carbon reduction and then slowly moving to carbon re removal, more into carbon removal as time goes by. I'll show you a slide in a second that talks a bit more about that um, from the Oxford University. But uh, in terms of prices, just to give you an idea at the moment, you know, if you're doing carbon reduction, you know, type carbon offset projects, funding renewable energy type projects around the world, um, you can offset probably from about, you know, six pounds a ton, you know, just as an order of magnitude. Whereas if you're using a direct air capture at the far right of this slide, you know, it's the cost at the moment if you go to one of the websites, it's £900 a tonne. So you've got £6 a tonne to £900 a tonne on the different sides of the screen. And because there's so limited amount of carbon that's being captured through direct air capture at the moment, there's only a few credits, that, a relatively small number of credits that are available to buy. So at the moment, uh, anybody buying credits into these types of projects is limited any company is limited to buying just 100 tons of carbon offsets a year through the direct air capture you know and obviously at 900 pounds that's still a lot of money at 90,000 90,000 pounds whereas that, that amount of money with focused on carbon reduction can make a much bigger a carbon impact 
um, if you're only paying six pounds a ton, for instance. Um, so I mentioned very briefly the Oxford principles. I think this is probably the most pragmatic approach to carbon offsetting and you know net zero, if you like, um, on the market at the moment. So I'd, I'd Google this if you, you know. My recommendation is to go out and Google this document. It's only a short document, but it's quite pragmatic and it kind of shows uh, a good approach to sort of hitting net zero. Uh, and they they recognise at the moment that I'll just read this to you that an immediate transition to 100% carbon removals is not necessary. You know, it's not necessary because actually if we, we focus on carbon removals at the moment, there isn't enough space to, to do it. The direct air capture plants require a huge amount of energy to do it. So if we're do not doing the first bit of, of reducing carbon emissions, we're going to have a big, big problem. Um, so it says it's carbon removals is not necessary, nor is it currently feasible. That's what I just said, but organisations must commit to gradually increasing the percentage of carbon removal offsets they procure with a view to exclusively sourcing carbon removals by the middle of the century, i.e. by 2050. Because actually, once we've done all the efficiency type things to reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, the only thing left is carbon removal. Uh, so, you know, the, all the projects that are going on at the moment in terms of carbon removal, really important because we need to develop these technologies to be able to get there. Um, a repeat of a, a one chart that uh, Peter showed earlier, because this is particularly important to show of how carbon removal and carbon offsetting can fit in with the uh, science based target initiative net zero strategy. So the, the purple parts underneath the line underneath the, the zero line are the carbon removals and there's a sort of in the three zone, there's this sort of grey area. <laughs> which is a compensation. They call it compensation. It's it's uh, it's the sort of more traditional carbon offsetting, if you like, that whilst you're on your path to net zero, you can be sort of carbon neutral as well by offsetting those carbon emissions. It isn't a requirement of SBTI to do that. Uh, hence, I think that's why they put it in grey, but it's a sort of nod to saying, actually, you could do this as well. And obviously, if you do that and help fund projects around the world, you know, it's better than just having a net zero target by 2050 because you're actually doing something right away to compensate your emissions right now. So I, <laughs> last night in my kind of rush to put these slides together, I thought, yeah, let's try and Google and find out some really good de definitions of net zero and, and carbon neutral. Uh, and actually, I was quite disappointed Googling around that it is really still quite hard to find really good definitions from either or either. Uh, I put up a net zero one here. This is from um, the IWA, IWA 412022 creatively uh, titled document, which I'll show you a bit more about in a moment. That's the new guidelines that the ISO produced. And that basically says that net zero is a condition where human caused greenhouse gases emissions are balanced by human led removals over a specific period of time. And then the carbon neutral definition I pulled from BSI's past 2060. Um, which I wasn't overly impressed by, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> but carbon neutrality, the, the the key difference between carbon neutrality and net zero is net zero, you've got to reduce your carbon emissions by 90% by 2050, at least 90% by 2050, and use carbon removal type projects uh, to balance out the remainder. Carbon neutrality, the definitions, you know, quite, quite as clear in terms of the amount that you should be reducing by. Most people give a nod to saying that you need to be reducing your carbon emissions as well. Um, and it's it's not it's it's open to allowing you to use the carbon reduction type carbon offset projects as well as carbon removal projects. So they're kind of the subtle differences. They're they're very similar though in all reality. Um, BSI's past 2060, this is a document I just referred to for carbon neutrality. This has been around for a little while. The 2014 edition is the latest one. It hasn't been updated for a little while. And that is that this is the kind of the second version of it. Um, and basically it sort of outlines how to quantify your carbon emissions, looking at scope one, two, and scope three, so sorts of things that a lot of you will already be doing. It has a requirement to develop a carbon management plan to have targets to reduce carbon emissions and know what you're going to do to achieve those targets. Then you've got to take action to reduce. Then you can declare a commitment to carbon neutrality without actually offsetting. 
Um, and then obviously you should offset those carbon emissions and, and meet that commitment to carbon neutrality and then produce what they call a qualifying explanatory statement of how you got there. It's worth having a look at the document. Um, you know, you can download this from BSI's website. Uh, I think there is a small fee to pay, so but I do recommend uh, having a look at that. Um, the other thing document I mentioned was uh, this is a the newer document that was released um, at the end of 2022, just last year. Um, produced by ISO. It's not an ISO <laughs> specification, it's a, it's their guidelines for net zero. And it is quite subtly different. It's not like 14,001 or 9,001. For those of you guys who people have done that, where they'll have lots of you shall do this and you will do this. This document is all about you should or you may do this. So it's, it's kind of soft guidelines. So you can't get a badge to say you've met the IWA 42022 net zero guidelines because they're just guidelines, but well worth reading. Um, the net zero definition I, I read out a little bit earlier, um, but they've got some specific definitions. They define what he, the human led removals are and what carbon offsetting is. Um, and they do you know, obviously recognize that there's, there's two parts of the offsetting. It could be the reduction or the removal part. So well worth having a look at that document and you can find that one on the ISO website. Um, talks about the targets that you need to set. So once again, it's very much in line, I think, with the science based target initiative. So it is talking about trying to stay within that 1.5 degree ambition that Peter talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so reducing your own emissions by 50 percent by 2030 and trying to achieve net zero by 2050 or earlier um, by you know doing the removal type carbon offsetting projects at the end and it does include all the all the scopes as well the documents a little bit longer than um, the bsi one and also the uh, oxford principles that's about uh, 40 50 pages but it is worth having a look at that as well good guidelines it does make sense um, and does provide a good framework for following um, so I, I thought we've done that. So I thought what well, it's worth just touching on what is a good carbon offset project because um, we often get asked this uh, by many people. So and these are the tests, if you like, of what a good carbon offset project is. So firstly, for an offset project to be good, it needs to be additional. So additionality is all about will the project have happened without your funding or the funding that the project's getting. If it would have happened anyway, it's not additional and it's not really an offset project. So people often come to us saying, oh, we've got a project to put up some solar panels in the UK and we've got some funding from the government, but we're thinking about also getting some carbon credits for it. And I say, no, because it's going to happen anyway. You're doing it anyway. <laughs> so you don't need the funding from the carbon finance. So it needs to have the carbon finance. The measurability, it needs to be something that we can measure the carbon savings from. So renewable energy is really good because actually we can measure the amount of energy that's coming off it and measure that. It becomes a bit harder with forestry type projects because yeah, trees obviously sequester different amounts of carbon at different times and things like that. And the reducing deforestation projects are also a harder to measure, but there are ways of estimating it. Um, it needs to be verifiable, needs to be auditable. So, you know, somebody can go in, see the methodology, see how it's done, repeat the calculations, come up with the same same answers. The projects need to be able to make permanent carbon savings. And this is a really key one. Um, and this is one where you know, sometimes you know, forestry type projects come into a bit of scrutiny of what happens if there's a forest fire and the forest burns down. How, how do you solve that permanence issue? And there are ways of sort of getting around it by having a buffer amount of carbon that's never released as carbon credits and it's sort of uh, all the projects kind of contribute to this. So there, there are ways of sort of looking at that, but there is always that question about permanence. Um, and I'm seeing sort of new types of carbon removal projects that look great, but actually it's probably only removing carbon for about 50 years and it, ne it needs to be ideally permanent or at least a few hundred years um, to really make it worthwhile. The leakage issue is um, if we start to do this as a particular project, is it causing carbon emissions to be moved somewhere else or is it causing other carbon emissions to be to be made? So we need to stop you know, making make sure that they meet that criteria. And then there's double counting to make sure that if you're funding the carbon credits and you're getting the benefit of the sort of 
the carbon offsets from that, you're the only person that is benefiting from those. So then those carbon credits aren't being provided to other ways, other people. Um, and that's usually done through, car you know, new carbon registries um, and, you know, retiring carbon credits in your, your name. And that's all very traceable. And I'll show you a bit of that in a second. So there are the one, two, three, four, five, six sort of good tests of a carbon offset project. And fortunately for us, there are international standards that sort of go through this this process and make sure those sort of tests apply to, to the projects that they um, verify and audit and approve. Um, and the, the the standards that we tend to use mostly are the VCS, the various verified carbon standard, the gold standard, and sometimes uh, the United Nations Green Development Mechanism, although we're using that less now. Because um, just because uh, CDM has sort of com coming to the to its end, um, but it, they all follow this sort of same. If you look at the the left hand picture here, the left hand schematic, it's sort of the diagram of how these standards work. And this one's specifically from VCS, but they all kind of follow the same process. Whereas at the core of the the standard, if you like, is the methodology and how it all works and the rules for how the standard works and these these methodologies they're not just kind of invented um, by one person it, they tend to happen through a, a period of consultation and meetings and lots of discussions with lots of different stakeholders including ngos academics uh, international um, I industrial experts and, and and lots of other people sort of come up with a way that the standards and specific standards for different types of projects work and then once you've got those methodologies, um, there's the whole auditability part of it and to make sure that so all the standards have independent auditors. So the standards are produced and maybe managed by Gold Standard or Vera, but then the auditors are from outside of those independent of the, the standard organisation and also independent of the project and independent of the carbon offset provider, etc. So there's you know the independence of that audit process. And then, like I said earlier, there's a registry system. So when the carbon credits are being verified and validated, they can get put onto the registries and then used and traded between different, well, moved between different companies. And then ultimately, and this is a this is a real part of the carbon offsetting, is that they get cancelled in in the company's name that's using them. So then they can't be used again. And I'll show you a bit more about that in the next few slides. So I mentioned that there's registries. The registries are super because they're a bit like bank accounts holding money. So you can transfer from one account to another, but money just can't be created and it can't be lost. It sort of stays between those accounts until it gets retired. And the retirement is effectively like ripping up the carbon credit. So it can't be used again. But you're like, but it, it, it actually gets your name put onto the registry, which I'll show you in the next slide. But the the registries are great because they show you, you know, you can log in, it's publicly available, you can find the projects that you're, you're interested in and been investing in, you can see all the documentation that goes with it, the initial project description document, the initial validation document, the uh, different verification documents as well. So it's all there and it's all quite transparent. It shows you who the project valid validator is uh, for this one. Um, we can see it's a company called DMV, which is a large international auditing body um, and Dutch, I think. Um, and yeah, so you got all that sort of information, which is which is great. Um, that one was that previous screen grab is from uh, the VCS registry. This screen grab is a retirement, a specific retirement that we've we've put through on the gold standard registry. So they're very similar in a way, um, but this just to show you two different sort of screenshots of different registries. This one shows here that we've retired some credits for one specific customer. It shows you the date that the credits were retired, the name of the project. It gives you the specific serial number of the credits that have been retired and obviously for the and which company it's for. So really good, really transparent. And from here, from this screen, which we can send you the link if you retire, through the gold standard registry you can click on the view project and see all that previous project documentation that i mentioned earlier in the previous slides so there you go that's a whistle stop tour really of what carbon offsetting is um the different types of processes that are there um so in summary you know the thing is 
just to start doing it, I think if you know what your carbon emissions are, you know, do the right thing and start compensating for those. It's part of a strategy to reduce your carbon emissions and ideally we should be, you know, reducing by at least 90% and as quickly as possible to have any chance of achieving that 1.5 goal or staying within that 1.5 degree goal ambition that Peter talked about. Um, yeah, you can set net zero targets for your organisation. 50% reduction by 2030, 90% reduction, like I say, uh, by 2050 at the earliest, but by the latest. <laughs> uh, plan to start using more and more removal projects and start, you know, creeping these into your carbon offsetting strategy. But don't worry about doing all carbon removal now because it's not feasible for everybody to do that. Uh, and we need to be focused on reducing the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And uh, look at, you know, being, you know, as, you know, as part of this overall strategy, look at being carbon neutral on the way uh, by offsetting. So it's, you know, the, the final line here is it's time to start your net zero pathway. You know, we can all do it. You know, Peter's shown us how you do it through the science based target initiative. You can pay to do it. You can just do it aligned to the science based target initiatives. There's no hard and fast rules. You can just follow that ISO gu guidance framework that I showed you earlier as well. Um, and then, yeah, offset your carbon emissions on the way to be carbon neutral whilst you're doing it. So you have an overall strategy to be car as carbon neutral, but also to be fully net zero. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Happy to take questions now or later. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have got a couple of questions coming through Ooh, on yeah. the chat, um, but actually I think more than one of the speakers here will probably have an opinion on those. Um, so I think we will leave those to the end. Um, I'll see anyone get any other questions. Do keep putting those through. We, we will definitely come back to them. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's probably best if we hand over to Amy and she can tell us about some nature based solutions uh, and some exciting stuff they're doing at Durrell. Are you there? Aha, can you grab the screen? I can. Can you see that? Uh, yes, I can. Great. Excellent. <laughs> OK, thanks, Duncan. And um, thanks, John, for, for, for that great um, overview of um, offsetting and removal. Um, I just I'm going to throw another definition into the mix, um, and that is nature based solutions, um, which, again, is, is another of these not very clearly defined terms, um, but it is used to differentiate between um, removal projects that involve things like reforestation as opposed to the 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 um, air capture and, and more, more technical solutions. So um, for those of you who, who don't know about Durrell, um, we're a conservation charity based in Jersey. We were founded about 60 years ago by the conservationist and author Gerald Durrell. Our mission is saving species from extinction and um, our work is focused on rewilding. Sorry. Hang on. Just. Our work is focused on on rewilding species and ecosystems around the world and also connecting people with nature. Um, before I go any further, I'll just give you a second to read this small piece that was written by Gerald over 50 years ago, and I think is probably um, as relevant, possibly more relevant now than it was when he wrote it. So through our work um, over the last 60 years, we've been sequestering carbon um, through saving habitat, um, but we've not really been talking about it. Um, we, 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 we did it and, and, and um, just quietly got on with it. Through years of research and practice, um, we know that species rich forest sequesters up to 40 times more carbon than some of these um, monocultures that you see. And you've all seen pictures of, of rows and rows of spruce trees in, in Canada um, and, and Northern Europe. Um, great for carbon capture, no biodiversity there. Um, whereas what we're working with is, is, is real um, ecosystems. About three or four years ago, we decided that we wanted to try and link um, climate and biodiversity concerns. Um, and we wanted to design 
an impactful solution, working with local communities and with our partners um, that we've been working with for many years. Um, our Rewild Carbon project is all about reforestation. And as, as John touched on earlier, um, reforestation is quite different to avoided deforestation. Um, we also feel very strongly that nature-based solutions or, or offsetting generally only works if at the same time those companies or organisations offsetting are also trying to reduce their emissions. So again, that ties in with, with what John um, has just been talking about. And at Rewild Carbon, we ask all our business partners to um, demonstrate to us that they are doing what they can to try and reduce their emissions. And they're just offsetting or balancing those that they can't yet um, avoid. So really, our view is business as usual just isn't an option. Um, and if organisations want to take a, a slightly more hands off approach to, to offsetting and carry on business as usual, then this probably isn't the project for them. Mm. Um, it's important to us that all our partners are really engaged and um, and we like to have a personal relationship with them and, and talk with them about you know, what they're doing and, and how their journey to net zero is going. Um, so Rewild Carbon, as I just said, it, it's about more than just sticks of carbon in the ground. Um, some mass market schemes uh, don't look any further than trees. Um, they have no biodiversity and, and very limited socioeconomic benefits. Um, high quality schemes, such as the ones that John's just been speaking about and, and Rewild Carbon, do much, much more than just reduce carbon. So Rewild Carbon um, is was set up, we, we have a project design document that I would be happy to share with anyone who is interested in reading it. It's, it's, uh, it's not a light read, but uh, I'd be happy to share it um, after today. It's based on a Plan Vivo standard, which is a, a recognised standard for offset projects. Because we're a registered charity, we are able to keep our admin costs to an absolute minimum and ensure that at least 90% of the funds we receive go to nature. Um, we have an in-house carbon registry where we record every transaction. Um, so that avoids reselling and double counting of carbon credits. We provide regular reports to all our business partners and each funder knows where their trees are planted. So they can, if they want to, follow their trees um, but they also get um, a, a lot of um, very transparent data on the, the broader project. Also, in the last few weeks, um, a, a recent development is that project data is now publicly available on a, a platform called Restore, um, which is a platform for, for um, offsetting projects around the world. Um, when we set up Rewild Carbon, um, and we, we, we started looking into it three or four years ago, we went through a two year development process and then launched in 2021. We took the view at the time that we were going to go for impact over certification. So although our project has been developed in line with certification standards, um, we have not actually gone through the certification process. Um, our view was that for a project of our size, it was a very expensive process. Um, it was also very slow and was going to divert our attention and our resources from work that could be done on the ground. Um, it also potentially would have diverted funds from nature where it was really needed and would have involved using outside consultants, whereas we wanted to work with the local community and experts based in the project region. That's not to say we wouldn't consider certification one day in the future if, if we felt the circumstances were right. 
So our first project um, is in the Atlantic Forest or the Mata Atlantica as it's known in Brazil. Um, and this map shows uh, where the trees are. It's, it's quite a long way inland. Most of it is in Sao Paulo state, um, although it does spread northwards and it also spreads down into Argentina and Paraguay. The little chap in the picture is a black lion tamarin. He is the, uh, the poster boy for our project. There are just a thousand of these little animals left in the wild and they mainly live in the project region. They're critically endangered and the main threat to their survival is habitat lost. They, they do depend on this forest. We've been working at Durrell, uh, we've been working for about 30 years with the species and we have the only captive population outside Brazil here in Jersey. We have, we have uh, 12 or 13 here in, in Jersey. And actually I was lucky enough to be in Brazil um, last week, I, I got back a couple of days ago and I this time last week I was sitting in the forest um, looking for tamarins. Um, I sat on the forest floor for five hours and saw a tamarind for one second. Um, but it was it was worth those five hours. It was it was really truly special to to see um, to see him. So the Atlantic Forest um, is an area that faces lots of challenges. The area in the back of this picture, which you can see, is actually a national park. So that is protected. The area in the foreground is typical of the landscape in this area. Um, forest has been removed for um, to, to provide pasture land. There's a lot of cattle farming, sugarcane and and peanut farming in this area. Historically, the Atlantic Forest is was one of the richest, most biodiverse habitats in the world. Only six percent of it remains now. Um, and that's the, the forest that does remain is in very small fragments that are isolated. So there is a risk of fatality for any animals that are trying to move between fragments. Um, genetically, um, there's, there's not enough mixing of animals. Um, so our project is all about um, developing or creating new tree corridors that join up these fragments of forest. And these corridors really are essential to wildlife. We have been doing this work on a very small scale for, for 20 to 30 years, um, but rewild carbon has enabled us to scale up our work enormously. Um, it has increased our funding for this work by probably about 100 times. Um, so really massive, massive impact on the work we can do. And we know that in the absence of this finance, um, the forest would, would simply not be restored. Another problem in the area is that there's a large landless community and poverty is, is particularly high. So John touched earlier on, on some of the methodologies around carbon offset projects. Um, I won't go into it in huge detail here. If you're really interested, please do read our, our project design document. Um, but um, we have a lot of very knowledgeable people working on the project. Um, it's not just a matter of scattering seeds and hoping for the best. Um, the, the conservation team go in, they diagnose the soil to work out the best um, method of, of, of um, reforestation. They plant 2,000 trees per species per hectare from around 100 native species. And those are divided between fast growing species that will shoot up and provide shade to protect the taller trees, the taller, slower growing trees that eventually will come through and provide the forest canopy. The trees are, the seedlings are developed in local nurseries, um, providing employment. Um, they're then planted by local teams and maintained for three or four years. Um, so again, providing employment for local people. All of our reforestation takes place on private farmland and there is state legislation in place um, in the area which states that um, at least 20% of privately owned farmland must be um, kept as forest. 
we enter into agreements with the landowners because they obviously need to comply with this law. They often don't have the resources or the know-how to do it themselves. So we go in, they fence the land, they create cattle, um, they prevent cattle getting in, they prevent fire breaks, and we go in and we effectively manage the land for us. There are also some areas where we put little, um, it, it's not feasible to, to reforest properly. So we put in little one hectare stepping stones of agroforestry, um, which, which allows local families to grow crops such as, crop, uh, as coffee, which we then help them to sell. As John hinted earlier, the, the carbon calculations are incredibly um, technical. Um, carbon in tropical areas, um, you, 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 the trees will absorb a lot more carbon than they would, for example, in a northern European forest. Um, in this area, typically, um, research has shown that it's over 300 tonnes of, of carbon per hectare over a 30 year period. Our calculations, we've, we've included reductions to allow for any error in calculation. We've also got a large insurance buffer in case of um, forest fire or so on. Um, we use LIDAR um, and drones to, um, to monitor the forest. And in fact, the drones fly over on a six monthly basis. Our, our team are constantly monitoring the below ground biomass as well. Um, so we are confident that our calculations are, are accurate and we are very happy to share them with, um, with our investors. We have um, monitoring protocols in place. Um, we feel that our project is very robust and science driven. We collaborate closely with our local partners. Um, the protocols are a combination adapted from the World Resources Institute Sustainability Index for Forest Landscape Restoration. We also um, check, are constantly checking the effectiveness based on theory of change. And if we feel we're doing something and it's not quite leading to the results that we think it should, we will go back and we will adjust our approach to, to make sure that, that what we're doing is effective. We are also, um, we're just reaching the, the end of the process of making sure that our protocols comply with VERA standards although we're not actually going through the certification process. Just thought you'd like to see a couple of pictures, um, a before and after. The, the picture on the left was taken um, just around the time, just before we launched Rewild Carbon. Um, and the picture on the right was taken just a few weeks ago. Um, so you can see the, the corridors really, um, they really make a, a the, they grow very quickly and they're making a huge impact. Um, the, I was in this corridor last week and it's amazing. You drive through the pasture land around it and there isn't a sign of any wildlife at all. No birds or very few birds. We went into the corridor and we saw macaws and toucans flying around and they actually fly along following the corridor. It's, it's really quite beautiful to see. So I just want to take you very, very quickly through the, the actual impact that our, our project has had in the two years since we launched. Um, so we have sold just over 35,000 tonnes of carbon credits. Uh, we've still got plenty more for sale, um, but it does mean that um, over, over the next 30 years, that is 35,000 tonnes of carbon that are going to be removed from the atmosphere. Um, so we are really very proud of that. In terms of reforestation, which uh, perhaps is a little bit more tangible for those of us that can't picture what a tonne of carbon looks like, um, we've planted 178,000 trees from 92 native species. Um, and we have restored 86 hectares of forest. For those of you that can't picture a hectare, it's roughly the size of an international rugby pitch. So um, quite a, quite a sizable area. And we have another 50,000 seedlings 
that are just about to go in the ground over the next few weeks. So that will be another 25 hectares um, restored over the next few weeks. In terms of biodiversity, the impact is, is almost immediate. These tree corridors create lifelines and provide cover for mammals within a year or two of, of being planted. Um, I mentioned that I saw macaws and toucans last, last week while I was in the corridors. Um, we also saw footprints in our corridors of tapirs. Now, these are trees that have been planted within the last nine months. They're already six to, to eight feet tall in places, and they are providing shade for mammals. So really, the, the impact is, is instant. Um, we have also, using sound recorders, audio recorders, we have detected at least 24 different species of bird in our corridors over the last few weeks. Um, Rewild Carbon has also enabled us to, to have our first member of staff in Brazil, which is fantastic. So much easier to coordinate and scale up our work with somebody there on the ground rather than through me sitting here in an office in Jersey. As well as the black line tamarins, we are also working with other species such as bromeliad frogs, such as this little one here, armadillos and giant anteaters. Um, and we work closely with local partners um, on the ground um, to build up capacity. There's a lot more we really need to do. Um, and I have to say, driving around last week in Brazil, every time I saw a corridor of trees next to a road, I, uh, I had dreams of, of putting in another road crossing to, to allow um, animals to, uh, to cross the road safely. In terms of community impact, um, it, it's just amazing. We've created um, or we're supporting 62 jobs in community nurseries. I'm very proud that almost 50% of those jobs um, are, are for women. We've got, um, we're supporting 13 jobs in forest restoration. And there's around 32 families are benefiting from additional salaries through our project. Um, I met a young chap last week who had moved from the, the nearest city where he was unable to, to, to find work. He and his wife had moved back to the area where they grew up and he had uh, got a job working for his aunt who, who owns one of these nurseries. Um, so really, really lovely to see the, the impact that this is having on, on young people who otherwise would have difficulty finding work. In terms of additional income, um, the, the teams that are working in reforestation are, are um, making up to £2,000 extra um, a month, um, which is a phenomenal amount in an area where the, the average income is, is only around £600. Um, if you do have any questions, we have got a the, the session just afterwards, um, but I'm also very happy to to have a chat on the phone or, or to send you information about the project. Um, just to say we've got around 40 businesses and organisations that have come on board in the last two years. Around half of them are based in the Channel Islands, but we've also got many that are based in the UK and, and further afield. Um, we recently had a, a Canadian finance company come on board. Um, so, so word is spreading and uh, all of those, all of those partners are helping us to, uh, to make a real difference. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time. And if I may, Duncan, I will hand back over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yep, yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming in. So if all the speakers could um, put your cameras back on and we'll uh, see if we can get some answers to them. Um, while everyone's coming back, um, Amy, but there's one question that is probably particularly relevant to yourselves. Um, you mentioned that you're not you know, certified or accredited to the sort of international standards. Um, but somebody asked whether you're call them customers or investors, um, whether they get a, a certificate saying that they've offset a certain amount. And 
what's the confidence i guess that they can have in that certificate if you're not part of a yeah no that's standard? that's that's a good question thank you um so we do issue as i said we we keep a, a register um which which is auditable um and we we register every transaction in that um and we do issue a certificate to everyone who who offsets or balances their emissions through us um we have gone for um transparency and we we share we we um we report um to our investors twice a year but in addition to that we are always happy to share data that isn't contained in our report um we are happy to share data with investors um and um to, to date we've all of our investors have come to us and said you know we we love what you're doing we believe in what you're doing and to that to us that is is more important than than certification um you know certification is is a good tool that is used by many projects um but uh in itself, it, it doesn't guarantee a good project. So, so whether you're going for a certified or non-certified project, it's important really to do your research and, and look at what the project is is really doing. Thank you. Um, on a similar topic, probably a question for Amy or and or John. Um, if us, if somebody's got a project that they want to get certified to one of these standards, so obviously they can attain, they can start selling credits. Um, you mentioned it's expensive. Is there any funding available? How would you get funding to sort of, you know, get yourself through that process? John, that's maybe for you. Yeah. Okay. Than me. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Although I'm happy okay. to jump in. <laughs> no, well, you know, any any project needs some investment to get it started. Uh, the way most carbon offset projects work is that they don't, they can't actually sell the carbon credits until the carbon savings have been made. Um, and that takes the risk away from the end customer. So the actual carbon finance part doesn't come until you know the project's already running um so what's required is investment up front uh, by people who are willing to take that amount uh, some risk that they may not get their money back um because the project may fail may not be as successful as they're planning so it, it's one of those areas that there are people who are willing to do that you, you can sometimes go to banks and they'll they'll provide finance but there are other, other investment type organizations I mean, I think it was, I only sort of half skimmed some of the questions that were coming up. It was, there was a project in Malawi that sounded quite interesting. I mean, I'm happy to have a chat to them. Um, we could potentially, we do actually ourselves, we've started to sort of invest in the early stages of projects to to get them kick-started. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we could potentially do do that and look at, look at the guys in Malawi and see what they're doing. It sounds interesting. Right, thanks very much. Um, Obviously, a lot of these projects are in poorer parts of the world, potentially a bit politically unstable. Um, you talked about the sort of 20 percent buffers and insurance risks. Does that also account for political risk or is that more about choosing where you're going to work in the first place? I think probably a little bit of both. Um, we are working in Sao Paulo State, um, which is miles from the Amazon very different from the Amazon um, and I, I believe um, that the in in some Amazon regions the the government requires a much higher proportion of land to be to be set aside for reforestation um, the laws have been in place in Brazil since the 1930s um, around this so they're they're way ahead of the UK on that front um, there is a question around enforcement um, but from the conversations that I have with people in Brazil where, where our project is, um, the, the government is pretty hot on enforcement and there are fines for people who don't comply. So, so everybody wants to and needs to comply with this. this. I'm only speaking for that area of Brazil. I, I can't speak for, for other parts of the world. John, I don't know if you've got anything to add from, I know you, you have dealings with a lot of projects in other places. Yeah, so yeah, we, we support yeah, forestry projects, uh, nature-based projects yeah, all over the world. Yeah, Brazil's one one area, but there are others as well. The, it's one of those things that there is that risk. Um, 
yeah the the, the world isn't a, a perfect smooth place that we all know that it's going to be politically stable forever and you know we, you know we're not in that fluffy cloud that i'd like to live in um that there are external influences um and that's it is sometimes the issue with the forestry type projects is that it's that question of how do you guarantee the permanence for long periods of time but you know we know forestry is a key part to solving climate change so you kind of got to accept that risk to some extent that there may be you know in 10 years time 50 years time 100 years time some political activity that we don't even have any insight to now may happen um, that, that could could impact the forest but it's not a reason not to do it because there's so many benefits for doing it and aim is sort of shown beautifully how, what those are so we've got to get on and do it and if we don't do it now then you know we have no chance so it's not a smooth world it isn't perfect but we've got to got to take action thank you and um, just changing tack slightly or for, for significantly in fact um, just we had a question about um insetting and investing in sort of carbon offsets but through your own supply chain um, I just wonder if anyone would like to comment on, you know, how common is it uh, and particularly how does it fit in then with science based targets and the sort of carbon neutral net zero definitions? Um, generally, it seems to be seen as a better thing, but I'm not sure whether it's actually included any, any standards yet. Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Peter, do you want to answer it? <laughs> no, I, I, can, I can do it if you like. Um, uh, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's a tricky one. Uh, insetting is about if it's if it's is purely in your own supply chain with the suppliers that you're you're using you're effectively helping them reduce your mm -hmm. scope three emissions so it's effectively reducing your overall wow. carbon footprint if you like so really useful thing to do and it's it's obviously obviously a good thing to do and it's supporting your supply chain as well uh, whether it's a carbon offset project, you know the, the test would you need those tests that I sort of asked earlier would have to be questioned uh, you know about the additionality permanence leakage etc cetera, etc cetera. um uh, has it been audited verified all that sort of stuff um if if it has and it's producing carbon credits the way that you know we'd like to see them sort of ecs gold standard five evo potentially um then you know yeah then yeah you can use those but it's i think you've got to make sure you know, it's it's robust otherwise you know it's yeah, do it it's helping your supply chain it is reducing your carbon emissions which is a good thing and it'll be probably helping other people reduce theirs as well so yeah <laughs> okay uh, and then we've got an interesting question from tim about um uh that they're moving offices um so i presume they're moving from an older inefficient office to a new briam certified one which would be more efficient um mm. And whether that kind of office move would could be, could be considered as an offset and emission, or whether that is simply just a lowering of your in-house emissions. Ah, uh, Duncan, you've kind of almost said it perfectly there. It, it, it is kind of a lowering of your own carbon footprint, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. You, the usual test is, you know, it, do you require carbon offset money to make that Briam excellent building? Uh, the building's already there. It hasn't required the carbon offsetting money, so it, it fails on the first additionality question, doesn't it? But it is it is a part of your strategy to reduce your carbon emissions, which is really important. So if you're going from an inefficient building to a really efficient building, then you're going to see the benefits of that through a reduction in the amount of carbon emissions and the reduction in the amount of carbon emissions you'll need to offset or remove um, which way, depending on which way you go. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, actually, I had a question on the ISO thing. Um, mm. I believe there's a new standard coming out from ISO to allow you to verify um, your net zero claim if you've got one iso was it 14 14 and 14068 something like that it's part of that series um but somebody mentioned in the draft this was a conversation i had the other day that buying renewable energy wouldn't be counted as um zero carbon under this new standard um and i just wondered is that true of the science-based target as it is at the moment um and if, if that is correct does anyone know what the sort of justification for that is Pete, do you want to answer it on the science-based yeah. target aspect? Yeah, I think that the kind of the key thing about buying renewable energy is it is very similar to the kind of the offsetting principles. It's about this principle around additionality, um, and that's really the kind of um, 
uh, kind of a hierarchy, if you like, in terms of the type of mechanisms that are available. So a kind of traditional green tariff, the energy already exists, you're just being allocated by an energy supplier. So it's not creating any additionality. So I think that would pro probably be the kind of principle um, that is being sort of taken forward under that draft international standard. Um, but of course, there are other ways of trying to improve the quality, uh, you know, in terms of taking up the hierarchy of, of the um, sort of renewable energy purchasing. So if it's going through things like a power purchase agreement, where you're kind of directly being allocated or directly investing in a solar farm or whatever it might be, and then directly allocated um, on a on a um, dedicated basis, that energy, that is you know, creating additionality. And that's kind of how you're then moving up um, the hierarchy. So I think this is something we're going to start to see a lot more kind of um, structure about in terms of kind of guidance about this principle about additionality with, with renewable tariffs um, sort of coming forwards. Um, but that's really kind of, that would be my kind of take on it at the moment. Yeah. And hopefully as time goes by, this, this these sorts of questions become less important as all the energy grids around the world decarbonise. And UK has a target to be zero carbon by 2035 anyway. So, you know, it, it becomes a non-issue in the future, but it's it's an issue now as you're sort of getting there. Yeah. Okay. Then. Um, the target from moving from 13% to 16%, um, someone's asking how that affects additionality in the UK Woodland Carbon Code. So if you've got, obviously, that comes to that, yeah, there's a question about additionality. If you're planting a forest um, and you are hoping to do that under the carbon code and get some credits, and then the legislation changes and says, oh, no, we're doing this anyway, is your project still additional? Well, it's, it's a target, isn't it? This is a target that somebody set um, that... Yeah. If there's funding, if there's funding, if it's a project that the government's already putting money into to make this happen, and you're buying credits from something that's being funded elsewhere, then it's not additional. But I, I'd see this as a target that's, you know, quite a hopeful target, <laughs> and and it needs all the effort to to go into try and make it a reality. But it isn't a reality yet. So yeah, if you're funding the tree planting or creation of woodland, um, it'll help achieve this target, and it should be. Additional, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, don't forget your feedback forms. Uh, if you can fill those in, then with that information will still be available um, after the session, as long as you've got the link. So you can fill that in at any time, and we'll. It's always useful to get that information on obviously how the event went, the timings, whether it was the right time of day for you, and those sorts of things, and also what interests. Uh, what topics you'd like in the future and whether you'd be interested in presenting to us on some of the projects that people have spoken about today. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on out there. Um, right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Very nice to see you all again and I uh, hope you all have a good weekend.